Beloved, I hope you have a copy of God's word and you are interacting with the scriptures as we work through the text today. So glad that you're here gathering and learning about God. Do you know what it's like to be an outsider? Have you ever had that experience? To not be a part of something? Or to be told that you're ineligible or to feel as if you're unapproved? On some level, each of us know what this is like. Well, today we're going to learn about a man who is an outsider. Last week we saw Philip is ministering amongst the Samaritans and he takes the gospel to them. He preaches the beautiful, glorious gospel. They believed, they're baptized. The apostles approve and affirm this ministry and the church is planted in Samaria. And this week we're going to see the Spirit take the same evangelist, Philip, and move him from the north in Samaria all the way down south towards Gaza from many people who are converted to now one who's converted, namely this Ethiopian eunuch. We see that Jesus says in Acts chapter 1 that the apostles are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria last week, and to the ends of the earth. And so as Philip brings the gospel to this one Ethiopian, he is traveling back to Africa. And the gospel is beginning to expand towards the ends of the earth. And we're going to see here God's provision for this one man who is seeking him. And as Luke has already recorded in chapter 15 of his gospel, there is rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. We're going to see that here today. The main idea from our text is God's gospel is for the outsider. We're going to see how he provides a messenger to explain it, a savior to save through it, and even the means for obedience. And this is a beautiful story that we're going to embark on today. And we have three points, and each of them point to God's provision in the text. God's heart, the faithful ministry of the evangelist, and one who is outside truly looking in, yet brought near. The first point we can find in verses 26 through 34, and that is this. God provides messengers to explain the gospel. The gospel to his people. We see in verse 26, an angel came to Philip, and he said to him, Rise, go toward the south to the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. You have to go through Gaza to get back to Ethiopia. Now, by this time, Gaza is not the city that it once was under the rule of the Philistines. It had already been conquered by this point by Alexander the Great. It wasn't the same city. This is why uh, many scholars believe, that's why uh, Luke describes it as a desolate place, as a desert place there in verse 26. If Gaza was not what it was, at least the road getting to Gaza might have been the desolate place too. We see in verse 27 that Philip arose and he went. He didn't just ask where he was going. He simply followed immediately as the Lord commanded him. It's a good application for us, by the way. When the Lord says something, let's go and do it, beloved. And notice how his obedience in verse 27 leads him to interact with one who is searching God, namely this Ethiopian eunuch. What do we know of this eunuch? Well, actually, quite a bit of descriptors are provided in the text. Verse 27, we see that he is, in fact, a eunuch, which is a man who has been castrated by a king to serve the females in his kingdom For the purpose of being faithful and not tempted in sexual immorality with one of the king's females. So he wanted to make sure that he can control how his women were treated. And so kings would castrate servants for such a responsibility. We also see in verse 27 that he was a court official. A court official is a position of authority. 
and he was in a position of authority as the treasurer, as you see here in the text, of Candace, who is the queen of the Ethiopians. Now, this is a privileged position. I want to make sure that you know that. Now, historically, in the kingdom of Ethiopia, there was a king, not just a queen, but the kings were considered to be like gods, too important to deal with the ruling affairs that occurred daily in the nation. And so their reigning was on high, and they would give the responsibility to the queen to rule the daily affairs. And the name of the queen for many years of the ruling monarch was Candace. It'd be like if the king of England was Henry all the time, generation after generation. That's what Candace means here, historically. Now we see that this eunuch is returning from Jerusalem where he went to worship. See, there in verse 28. And more than likely, he's a proselyte. That means a Gentile who has accepted the teachings of Judaism. He's a Gentile who is a God-fearing man and who went on an awfully long journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Now, Ethiopia in ancient history was where Sudan is today. But he went, and as it says there in the text, he's worshiping in Jerusalem. And now he's returning home, probably a bit dejected. He's reading, as it says there in verse 28, he's reading the prophet Isaiah. And as we will see, he doesn't understand what it is that he is reading. But probably dejected, going to Jerusalem, looking for answers, hearing about what's going on, but still kept from the inner parts of the temple where he would learn from the leaders of the day. According to the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, a eunuch was not allowed into the inner parts of the temple. He was not allowed to go there. And so he was kept at a distance from being able to learn and worship like the rest of Israel. So not only is he a Gentile, but he's also a eunuch. Kind of two steps removed from being able to be with the people who worship the God that he believes in. Now, a couple of observations here in verse 29. We see the work of the Spirit take over. The Spirit commands Philip to join his chariot, verse 29. Philip is full of the Spirit. Notice what it says there. And he ran to him. Isn't that great language? He runs to him, and he heard that he was reading Isaiah. And Philip asks him, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I? Unless someone guides me. This brother needed help. He needed help to understand what Isaiah was talking about. So think about this. God had sent a man to another man who wanted to understand who he was. It's as if the Ethiopian eunuch was like, help me understand God. Help me understand who he is. It's better to tour London with a tour guide than by yourself. It's better to tour the scriptures with someone who understands the scriptures than to read them by yourself. What specifically was he reading? Well, that answer is provided us in verse 32. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shears, silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Well, we know if we understand the scriptures that he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. And probably verse 8 as well. And a lot of scholars believe that this is actually an abbreviated summary of what he was reading. He's probably reading the entire song of the suffering servant, which would have been Isaiah chapter 52 and Isaiah chapter 53. And these passages, this, this exaltation, this song is describing one who is silent before his accusers, one who would suffer and not open his mouth, 
uh, one who is humiliated and deprived of any and all justice, and one who appears to have no descendants because is taken from him. And notice the specific question that the eunuch asks there in verse 34. About whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? I hope we recognize that this eunuch, who is more powerful than Philip in a societal sense, has the humility to ask what the passage is saying in a general sense. And not just in a general sense, but a specific sense. Who is the prophet referring to? It's actually a question that the Jews still ask today. Maybe you're in this room today. And you know parts of the scriptures. And, and you, know, you know stories in the Bible. But you don't understand them. Please don't feel shame in that. Don't feel any shame. I would encourage you to be very much like this eunuch. Who is so hungry to know who God is. That he's asking someone, would you please explain to me. Who God is that I might understand. Specifically, who is this, this prophet that the prophet is, is referring to? Wanting to know what the scripture means is tethered to the idea and the fact that you want to know who God is. So don't feel any shame today. There's also an application for us to see that we need to be willing and able to explain to the scriptures. Because many people are around us who do not understand them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as the text moves forward. But we're going to see here, not only does he provide someone who explains the scriptures, but the person that he provides understands the Messiah of the very scriptures that he is explaining. Look with me in verse 35 for our second point. And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. So he starts explaining the scriptures, and he explains the gospel of Jesus to this eunuch. Philip knew the interpretation of the Bible was through the lens and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so he just simply gives him the Bible, excuse me, gives him the gospel as he's reading him this portion of the scriptures. And he's teaching him both the sufferings of this promised one as well as the glories of this promised one as Isaiah 52 and 53 unfold. Now we've been talking about this a lot lately. But I want us to see again in the Old Testament that it is just as much about Jesus as the New Testament Graham Goldsworthy, one of the foremost voices of biblical theology, addressed the essentialness of Jesus in the Old Testament with this quote. L listen to this quote. It's, it's, it's very helpful. Because the New Testament declares the Old Testament to be incomplete without Christ. We must understand the Old Testament in light of its goal, which is Christ. In light of the goal of the Old Testament, which is Christ, Jesus is indispensable to a true understanding of the Old Testament as well as the New. I hope we see, as we're going through the book of Acts, that yes, this is a book about taking the gospel to the nations, and it's about church planting, and it's about missions. But I want us to see that nobody understood fully the interpretation of the Old Testament until the completed work of Jesus was done. His life, death, burial, resurrection, and his ascension, where he is now seated, doing no work except praying and interceding for us, was completed. And at that point, he unlocks the disciples and the followers' minds to understand that he's holding all of it together. It's so crucial for us to understand the scriptures. And, and Peter got this, and John got this, and Philip gets this, and Stephen got this. 
And that means 800 years when this prophecy was made about a suffering servant who was crucified to atone for the sins of his people, Isaiah is describing the Messiah and Philip is saying, I know who the Messiah is. I know who he is. This is him. The very heart of God's mission from the beginning is the son of promise. And the son of promise was promised at the very beginning of Genesis. And from the foundation of the earth, the son has had his eyes set on Calvary, moving towards it to redeem a people. And this eunuch wants to know who this guy is. Who is this? And Philip explains to him. He explains to him the one who has completed the substitutionary work for sins. Because the reality is, as the Old Testament tells us, because sin... Because of sin, sin always demands and commands a death. Always. Sin always commands a death. We see this in the Old Testament law. We see this in the sacrificial system. It's either going to be the sinner or it's going to be the sacrifice. But in one way or another, sin always demands a death. And what he's saying from Isaiah 53 is, we see in verse 32 there, he's like a lamb. He's like a lamb who's going to lay down his life for his people. And this is good news. And you have to know who Christ is to interpret back into Isaiah 53 what is going on in the biblical narrative and what has actually now happened some few months back in Jerusalem. And we see in the Suffering Servant Song, there's these these themes that are developing in verses 52 and 53 that this suffering servant is actually also going to be exalted in Isaiah 52 verse 15, and he's going to sprinkle blessing on the nations. You know Philip is telling him this. You know Philip is telling him, this is the Messiah that's going to sprinkle blessing on all the nations, eunuch, be encouraged. You know that he's telling them that though he was despised and rejected and he suffered, he did so for the transgressions of the people and the father was pleased to crush the son for this sake. Isaiah 53 verses 1 through 6, we see that he's willing to suffer and experience injustice. That means unfairness because he's a spotless one for the sake of those that the wrath of God should have fallen on. We see that he's the suffering one who was to make his life an offering for sin. He is the sacrifice. He is the payment, the atonement, who will justify many throughout the nations, Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, and bear the iniquity of us all. He's explaining how Jesus was rejected and despised, and he died, and he was perfect. He did suffer, but he's also the exalted one who raised from the dead. Beloved, you cannot understand the Bible unless you understand the whole Bible to see that Jesus is the center of it. And as long as you will have me be your pastor, we will preach that. You cannot look back on the Old Testament and not see how Jesus fulfills the temple. You cannot look back and not see how how Jesus is the greater Moses who fulfills the law. He doesn't just give it. He's the greater David. He is the greater David who sits on the throne forever. He is the answer to the prophets. He is answer to the covenants. All of the Old Testament finds its yes in Christ. That's what Paul writes. And he's explaining this to him. It's not like Philip has a New Testament. The New Testament didn't exist yet. Have you thought about that? There's no glorious gospel of Luke to turn to. He doesn't have the profound theology that Paul has later writes in the book of Romans or the Christology that Paul writes in Colossians. It's not there. All that Philip has is this parchment of Isaiah. And from this little parchment, he explains the whole Christ. And you know what? The eunuch believes. He believes. As we see in verse 36, he wants water to be baptized So think about this man, this eunuch, a man devalued, 
by the people he wanted to worship with, that you cannot get into the temple. He was dehumanized, castrated, in order to serve an earthly king. And as the gospel is brought near to him, he is now a dignified son of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what's profound is if you keep reading in the book of Isaiah, perhaps he had it with him in the chariot that day, you see that this blessing goes to the foreigners, as is the theme from Isaiah 40 all the way up close to chapter 60. But God has a specific word for eunuchs. A specific word. You, you might not have a generation in this life. Your life will end and no life after you will continue. But in Isaiah chapter 56, verses 4 and 5, he tells the eunuch, Hey, I have good news for you, eunuch. I'm going to give you a name that is everlasting. I'm going to bring you in to my courts that you may worship me. So you were set apart, unable to worship, and I will bring you near. And you are going to have an eternal future, an eternal heritage. We still look. That way, or at least society does on the, on the outsider. Isn't the society pretty harsh with the outsider or with the elderly today? Or the person who's a little bit different or those with extra needs? But if we're real honest with ourselves, we all kind of feel like an outsider looking in just like this eunuch and all of a sudden, God him, and he understands exactly what the prophet Isaiah is saying. Because God has provided someone to explain it to him. Beloved, this eunuch is a picture of every uncircumcised Gentile who is far off and an outsider. And I'm looking at a lot of you today. A lot of you. His physical limitations are a picture of our spiritual limitations. You might not be from Africa You might not be uh, serving an earthly king in this life. You might not be a male and you might not be castrated. But I want you to know you're a Gentile who is far off and your soul is castrated. That means you are impotent to be faithful, to be fruitful and multiplying. You, You cannot do this without God. There is no spiritual Hope works that you can bring apart from the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. This eunuch is truly a picture of us all. And the gospel is brought near. And we who are far off are brought near. And we are given a future as the Gentiles to be grafted in to Christ. Heirs to the promise. The eunuch could not get into the temple, but now he has access to the presence of God through Jesus, who is the better in living temple. It's amazing, too, what the, what the prophet writes there in verse 32, or verse 33. The one who was despised and rejected. He had no generation because his life was taken from him. But here is the reality. The one whose life was taken from him does have a generation because he raised from the dead. And those who did not have a generation like us, like the Gentiles, are actually given a generation to dwell with him forever. He is the first fruits of the resurrection and we follow after him. Beloved, I pray that we are a community, a community of people who gather together and admit Admit that we are outsiders and that we're far off. Riding around in our carriages, confused by it all, hoping somebody explains it to us. But by the mercy of God, he did not leave us unattended. But he drew near to us. 
and to show us this Christ that we need and this provision that has been made. And so when we gather in our communities, I pray, because we do have a future generation before us, that we would be filled with the desire to care for one another and to bear with one another and to serve one another and to love one another as Christ has done all of these things for us. So God gives his people the scriptures. God gives his people help to interpret the scriptures and God has provided the interpretive key of all the scriptures, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want us to see here that God has arranged this meeting of the unconverted. And beloved, he is still arranging meetings today of the unconverted. Let's be like Philip asking a question. Do you know what you're reading? What do you think of God? Where are you going after you die? Oh, that we would be a people that do not let chariots go by us but that we would be willing to run to them because we believe so much in the gospel and so much in the saving power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit that we would be willing to go and trust that when the word is proclaimed, that the spirit can do work on the heart to confess and to believe. Oh, I pray that we're thankful for, for his word. The word has been given here. The man is in confusion until the word has been given here. Beloved, Reminders, be students of your Bible. Be a student of your Bible. If you want to be a good evangelist, study your Bible. Take the truths of the Bible forward. You don't need to, to sit there and worry. It's all there for you in the scriptures. And if you don't know something, come back to the person. Walk, keep going, be faithful, be thankful for the scriptures. Beloved, let's be thankful for those who God has put in our life to help us understand the scriptures and who are willing to explain the scriptures. We need people who understand Christ and to interpret the scriptures rightly. And if you're like, Blair, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to understand the Old Testament. Please come and email me, talk to me, any pastors. We will give you resources. If you need us to start a class, we'll do it. But this is so crucial to help other people understand the scriptures because a bad interpretation of the scriptures can be actually quite harmful. We can begin to moralize things. We can begin to see ourselves in the Old Testament characters. Have you ever heard the example that we're like Davids who are fighting our own Goliaths every day? That's not true. David is a picture of a greater David who is going to come. Goliath is a picture of a big problem before David. The problem of sin and death. And just like little David defeats Goliath, Jesus defeats sin and death. He's dead and then he raises he crushes sin and death with his foot. And the scriptures refer to Christ as the stone. He is most certainly the rock. The rock that crushes the head of the serpent forever and always. If you want help in interpreting the scriptures, we would love to help you and serve you in this way. Just as men have helped me and served me and women as well. We can presume that Philip discussed with the eunuch about the way to Christ and to receive the benefits of his death and resurrection because the next topic here is baptism. Whether the eunuch knew about baptism as it was perhaps already being taught as the Christian initiation in Jerusalem, we don't really know. But we know that he understood it because we see in verse 36... That's what happens. But I want us to see more than anything, God provides the means for this eunuch to be obedient. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. So as he is teaching, the chariot kept kind of going along. But then the eunuch asked another question. Look with me there. See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot 
to stop. And they were, and excuse me, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. So if you remember what it says in verse 26, that it was a desert place, God is merciful to provide water here as they're traveling along the way. He's merciful for no barriers to be there anymore. Not only is there water, but it doesn't matter that he's a Gentile. There is no barrier. I want to identify with this Jesus. Now, if you have your ESV and you say your favorite verse in all the Bible is Acts chapter 8, verse 37. I'm going to have you look down there and it's not going to be there. Do you see that? I'm not going to draw a ton of attention there today. If you have a King James version, you'll see that it's there. There's a difference of interpretation based on the historical text traditions that each the King James Version and then the tradition of the Alexandrian, which is what NIV, ESV, NAS all use. We use this because we think it's, we think it's a little bit tighter at the very base of the trunk. Uh, and no things were added on to help the reader understand what was going on in the context. So, just want you to know that. If you have more questions about that, please shoot me an email uh, this week. So the eunuch believes that Jesus is the Christ of God. He believes the gospel, and immediately he wants to identify with Jesus through baptism. So Isaiah 53 points to God's salvation in Christ as the suffering one who's going to atone for the sins of the world. And the eunuch's like, I want to identify with Christ in baptism. You remember Romans 6? Buried with Christ in baptism. And I want to identify with the exalted one that Isaiah is also talking about. Raised to walk in newness of life. This is what he wants to do. And he wants to do it now. A couple of observations quickly. They went down into the water. It's immersion. There was enough water there. And then it says they came out of the water there in verse 39. You want us to see that baptism precedes faith and trust in Christ. We've seen this in Acts 2. We've seen this in, in um, Philip's ministry last week to the Samaritans, and we see it again. When the gospel is preached, the spirit does a work in the heart, and the response in identifying as a member of the household of God is to be baptized. And so we see that just naturally unfold throughout the scriptures. Verse 39, and when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. That means it seized Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. So the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And though the eunuch did not see him again, he went his way rejoicing. He kept going to Africa rejoicing as the first convert in that country. Amazing. He's baptized into Christ. That's what we identify with when we're baptized. And as the church is expanding, God miraculously, through his spirit, moves Philip into an encounter with this man. And he says, before you go to Africa, is essentially what he's saying, I want you to know what you're reading and I want you to be saved and I want you to be baptized. When you are baptized into Christ, you are subsequently baptized into his church. If the unit kept going, there's no one in Africa to baptize him. Baptism is not something that you can do by yourself. What a mercy that God has provided one to baptize him before he takes the gospel and plants the church, as tradition suggests, in Africa. So he's not baptized outside the church. He's simply taking the gospel as the first member of the church in Africa. Verse 40, but Philip found himself at Azotus. And, uh, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to, uh, to Caesarea. So God continues through his spirit to move Philip, this wonderful, faithful deacon evangelist, to do the work that he's called him to. Beloved, I want us to remember in all of this glorious talk today that God provides 
for his people. And he does it for our good because he loves us. But more than anything, he does it for his glory. There's so many times in the Old Testament that he says, I save for the sake of my name. I I, I save because the nations need me. My glory is what my people need, not sin. My love is what they need, not hate. He does all of this both to glorify himself as the one God in all the cosmos. And then he does it for our good. A few takeaways today in our closing. First and foremost, rejoice. Rejoice that Jesus treats his servants differently than earthly kings treat theirs. The Ethiopian king said, you have no future in my kingdom. And Christ says, you have a future in mine. Jewish leader says, you cannot worship in this temple. Jesus says, I'm coming to you so that you can worship with me. You can worship me in spirit and in truth. Jesus came to save sinners, beloved. He came to save Gentiles. And we didn't deserve it. There is no sin that any of us have ever committed that is stronger than the grace that is provided in Jesus' name. And so he comes and he saves us and then he gives us a future that no man here on this earth can give us. So rejoice because Jesus treats us differently. Rest in God for he provides and he pursues his people. God provides the covenant promise in Abraham. Hey, you're going to be the father that blesses many nations. The gospel is given to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17. And God continues to provide everything that we would need. You're an outcast. I'm coming to you. And then he gives us a a Messiah, and then he gives us a message, and and then he gives us a messenger to explain the gospel, and then he provides his spirit, and then he provides water and the church, and he provides all these things for life and godliness, everything. Today, are you worried, tired? Do you feel unseen? Do you feel kept out? God rushes to his people, and he provides. This is the heart of our God. Remember the Spirit's leading. Remember that the Spirit orchestrates all these divine encounters. The Spirit prompts us to share the gospel. How often do we obey? How often do we fear man rather than fear God? He provides the word. He provides understanding to the word. And he moves us on where we... Oh, that we would not live in the flesh, but that we would live... In the spirit. I want you to reflect on Philip's Christ like life. This guy loved people. He's loving on the widows in Acts chapter 6. He's loving on his enemies last week. And now he's loving on the foreigner outcast because he believes so much in his own. Sinfulness and how the gospel has forgiven him. And he's led by the Spirit. This is a man who's led by the Spirit. He knew the Scriptures. And he knew the God of the Scriptures. He knew Christ. And he knew how to explain Christ from the Scriptures. He encourages a brother to repent and believe. And then he leads him to be baptized. If you think about it, Philip is a microcosm of obedience to the Great Commission. Go therefore into all nations, teaching and baptizing. He's a great commission Christian. I pray in the years ahead, now and in the years ahead, that this room, this church, this body would be full of great commission Christians who are full of the Spirit. Study the life of Philip. You just need a few parchments of scriptures to be changed. 
that the Spirit would help us see and that we would be like him. Receive the eunuch. Receive the eunuch and anyone who is a sinner. Many, beloved, are still seeking. Many are willing to listen. Many have yet to confess and repent and be baptized and be brought into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is a doorway in to the church. And the doorway is explained in John chapter 10 as Jesus, I am the door. And those who walk through that door identify with Christ in baptism. There are so many people who need to hear the word of God today. Let's not run from the eunuch for being different or sinful or an outcast, but let's run towards him and let's receive him. And then finally, repent and believe. Repent and believe and then be baptized. Repent and believe and then be baptized. This is a picture of a New Testament baptism. Believing in Christ, believing in the the gospel that God has provided as someone explains it to someone and then being baptized. Have you been baptized? I want to appeal to you that that is the way of the New Testament. That is the way of God to identify with Christ, to identify as his covenant people. Perhaps you're confused. I was baptized when I was younger, and then I, I, maybe I was saved when I was older. Come and talk to us. We'll work through that. But repent and believe and then be baptized. Take these things to our heart today. Talk about them in your groups. And believe again, beloved, in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, your word is living and active It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It separates bone and marrow, soul and spirit. You have the words of eternal life. Would you implant them into the hearts of people who do not know you? And would you restore and renew our hearts of us who do? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.